Okay, this is the last class of this series in the Psalms. I have definitely learnt a lot by doing the prep for these classes. I hope you have benefited too. As we close this study, I thought I'll do a quick recap of what we have uh, been through so far. We began with three weeks of introduction and then we sp spent ten weeks studying individual Psalms. We began with just discussing why should we study the Psalms, what is the relevance, where do we use the Psalms, and we said it's used in corporate worship and in prayers and private devotions and uh, for teaching and instruction. Um, we talked about how the Psalms are structured. They're not a random collection, they're actually organized into five books, and these books reflect the different eras of Israel. Books 1 and 2 reflects the era of David. Book 3 reflects the era of the captivities by the Babylonians and the Assyrians. Book 4 reflects the era of the exile. And book 5, the restoration coming back from exile. And then we talked a little bit about the kind of poetry that we see in the Psalms. Um, parallelism is one of the key features that we see in Hebrew poetry and then others like chiasm and plusios, repeated refrains and then also acrostics which is um, one of the key features of Psalm 119 that we are studying today. There are different types of Psalms that we saw. There's lament, praise and thanksgiving which are probably the most common ones. And then there is Psalms of Confidence, Psalms of Remembrance, Wisdom Psalm, and Kingship Psalms. And uh, when it comes to the New Testament, the Psalms are in fact the most quoted book in the New Testament. And uh, Psalms look at it from the lens of the coming of the Messiah. And we talked about direct prophecy and typology and application. And after that, we started looking at individual psalms. Uh, most of these were done by Henry and a couple by me. We began looking at uh, the foundational psalms, which are Psalms 1 and 2, which really set the tone for the whole book. Uh, there are two contrasts. Psalm 1 has a contrast of the way of the righteous versus the way of the wicked. And Psalm 2 has a contrast of the kingdom of the Messiah, the kingdom of the righteous one, versus the kingdom of the wicked. And then we started looking at some praise psalms. Psalm 103 is a praise for God's salvation, God's mercy to his frail and sinful people. And then Psalms 8 and 19 are praise psalms, praising God as the creator, and the lawgiver. Then we switch to some lament psalms. Psalms 13 and 88 are laments during really dark times and trusting in God during that time. In Psalm 73 is a lament as to what's going on in the world. We see the condition of the world, the wicked prosper, and how do we trust in God's justice in the middle of that. Right. Psalm 51 is again a lament, but it's a lament for personal sin, what happened with David and Bathsheba. It's a psalm of repentance and uh, restoration. Psalms 23 and 91 are uh, psalms of confidence in God's protection. And deliverance and then we ended with Psalm 119 which is a wisdom psalm. Okay, so that's what we have seen up to last week and picking up from there last week we looked at uh, Psalm 119 we broke it up into two parts we said that Psalm 119 um, it's one of the most precious psalms but it's also just because of its length it can be intimidating we talk about how we can approach the psalm one of the interesting features of the psalm is that it is an acrostic. It's divided into 22 stanzas. Each stanza has eight verses. And the acrostic is basically when, based on each letter of the Hebrew language, different verses begin with consecutive letters. In fact, Psalm 119, the first eight verses all begin with the first letter Aleph. And then the next eight verses all begin with the next letter, bed, and so on. And we talked about how we can approach this Psalm 119. Just so big, if you study the whole thing, we tend to lose steam. So we suggested, you know, we can look at it in chunks. 
uh, take a few stanzas at a time, meditate on it and so on. Also we talked about the word law, there's eight synonyms of the word law that's used in this psalm. Almost every line has a different synonym. And these were Torah, which is the main word that's used, is usually translated law, but the broad meaning of the word is really instruction. So when we hear, see a, a verse like, oh, how I love your law, it's my meditation all the day. Uh, it's really talking about how I love your instruction in that generic sense. And so the, there are other words like word, uh, judgment, testimonies, commands, decrees, precepts, promise, and so on. See, these are the different ways in which Psalm 119 talks about the word of God or the law of God. That's where we ended last week. So today we're going to conclude with the second part of the study through Psalm 119. This is how we're going to approach it. We're going to just take a, <clears throat> a look at what we see about God's word, a portrait of God's word in the psalm. And then we'll take a look at the author of the psalm, a portrait of a godly man. And then we'll spend uh, time studying one of the stanzas, verses 33 to 40, and spend some time in discussion. Okay? All right, let's dig in. These are four questions that I got from Mark Dever when he preached at the Shepherd's Conference on um, Psalm 119. They overlap and one flows from the other. First of all, what is God's law? What is God's word like? What does it do? And then how should we respond to it? So let's quickly go through these. To answer the question, what is God's law? What does it mean in Psalm 119? Is it really just referring to the Mosaic Covenants? When he says he loves God's law, is he talking about, you know, I love all the Levitical commands about the animal sacrifices and all of that. What is it all about? Especially as we come from a Christian perspective from New Testament eyes, these words can seem a bit alien to us. Right? So in the New Testament, the word for law that's used is the Greek word nomos. Uh, according to the English Greek lexicon BDAG, there are three possible meanings that the New Testament uses this word. One is just a collection of holy writings, which is typically the books of Moses. It's just those books. It can also mean writings outside of the book of Moses, because sometimes Paul says, as it says in the law, and he'll quote something from Isaiah or from the Psalms. It can mean that, but primarily it's the books of Moses. It's really the writings. So that one sense, the word law is used. Another sense is, this is actually very common also, the legal system of the law. And there's the contrast of law versus grace. You're not justified by the law in that sense, right? And then there's a more generic way of a rule or a principle or a norm, like a law of nature. And this uh, sense is used too in the New Testament. So all that to say that in New Testament, the word law is, in, is used in different uh, ways as well. But let's look at what is the Psalm 119 itself means, right? So as we saw last week, it can mean instruction, word, God's judgments, God's testimonies in scripture, decrees, and God's commandments, precepts, promises, and so on. It really gives a, a multifaceted picture of what God's word is. So I think it makes uh, sense to say that it's really the whole revelation of God in various forms and not just limited to like the Levitical law or the Old Testament law. And in the New Testament, we have greater revelation through Jesus Christ. Uh, Hebrews 1 verses 1 to 2 are uh, very instructive where it says that God has spoken in the past through various means, but now he has spoken through his son. Right? Now, that doesn't mean the Old Testament scriptures are irrelevant either for us because a couple of very classic texts on the Old Testament scriptures are 2 Timothy 3.16 and Romans 15.4 where we see that these were given for our instruction as well. So, it's really the whole revelation of God. And Psalm 119 is not listing for us what are the commands of God, but rather showing us how to obey, how to respond to the law of God. 
And just one final point uh, that I want to make is that biblical Christianity is not antinomian. Anti means against, nomian is nomos, against the law. Uh, there is a tendency in some Christian circles to differentiate law and grace so much to the extent of wanting to say that you are saved by grace, you expressed faith at some point of time in your life and irrespective of how you live, irrespective of whether you obey God or not, you're still saved and you can be called a carnal Christian. So that's one of the dangerous teachings and that affects quite a bit of evangelical Christianity. So I actually was doing a Google search and I found an article from Living Hope Bible Church on this. Then I looked at, okay, that's not our Living Hope Bible Church, it's another Living Hope Bible Church. Maybe Pastor Joe's notes about that church. I have no idea who they are, but I thought that was a good article. And that's why I printed that out and gave it as one of the handouts. It's about that carnal Christian. Uh, I would recommend, you know, take a look at that when you have a chance. It goes through this problem in quite a bit of detail. Okay. So all that to say, what is the law of God and is it relevant to us even? So I think the answer is yes, it is the whole revelation of God and we have to look at it for, through the lens of the New Testament. So what's God's word like? That's the next question. God's word as revealed in the Bible, we know is unlike anything else. It's unlike any other book, right? Um, I'm going to go through this quickly, but we know God's word is true and it's trustworthy. God's word is good and it's righteous, it's eternal, and it ultimately reflects who God is. Right? God's word is a reflection of God, like verse 137, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. There's a close connection between God and his word. The Bible is not God, but outside of the Bible, we cannot know God and what he wants us to do. And the third question, what does God's word do? Or what does God do through his word and how does that impact us as we go to his word and read his word and obey his word? Right? I think overall God's word blesses us. That's how it starts in verse 1, right? Blessed are those who walk in the way of the Lord, those who are blameless. And in verse 137, we even see this ironic blessing. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. So ultimately God's word blesses us in different ways. It brings us light and understanding. Probably the most well-known verse in the psalm is verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Right? And it fills us with delight and rejoicing. So many times so through the psalm he talks about this. 162, for example, I rejoice in your word as one who finds great spoil or great treasure. Inspires awe and rever reverence. Right? Verse 120, my flesh trembles for fear of you and I, I'm afraid of your judgments. And so on and so on. And then it guards us from sin. We studied in the last class about uh, how can a young man stay pure and how do you uh, guard yourself from sin. It causes us to grieve over sin, not just our sin, but when you look at the sin of the wicked around in the world, right, there is a grief that the righteous person feels. And all of that is stirred by the word of God. Brings life and revival, brings liberty, and delivers us from trouble. We see many times through the psalm how he prays for deliverance. Brings peace and perseverance. For example, verse 165, those who love your law have great peace. Nothing causes them to stumble. All right. Now, how do we respond to this? In the last class, we went through this exercise, actually looking through a couple of stanzas and see what are the different ways that we respond. There's a lot of that in the Psalms. And, but here I've listed just five of those. Um, you obey, that's how it starts in the verse 1 and 2. It's about obeying and following God's command and loving and delighting. It's not a blind obedience, but it's a love and delight. And then meditating. So verse 97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And this meditation, again, is unlike Eastern meditation, which is a clearing of or emptying of the mind, whereas 
Biblical meditation, as we know, is meditating on the word. It has content that you're meditating on. Right? Verse 148, my eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on your words. He's almost saying like I'm, I'm up late at night or waking up early in the morning and I'm meditating on the word. Right? And trust, in a sense, this is a sum of bringing a lot of uh, problems and challenges to the Lord. You know, it's actually a lament psalm in some sense. So there's a trust that's always part of a lament psalm. Verse 74, for example, I wait for your word and fear of the Lord. So these are some of the responses uh, as we talked about. Right? So um, moving on from here, the next item that I briefly want to touch on is uh, about the psalmist who wrote the psalm. We don't actually know a whole lot about this person. The psalm doesn't tell us who wrote it or what was the historic context. This is just a quick recap from a slide from last week. Uh, many commentators think that the psalm was written during the exile or after the exile. And maybe it was Jeremiah or Ezra, but many others think that it was David too. So even though we don't know who it was, we can see a lot of the characteristics of this psalmist as we read through the psalm. And we said that it's a wisdom psalm, but it's not strictly a wisdom, wisdom psalm. There are some uh, commenters who think that it's actually a psalm of lament. It's appropriate to call it a psalm of lament because he's bringing so many of his struggles to God and his response is really to rely on the word of God in the middle of his challenges that he's going through. So with that in mind, what do we see about the psalmist in the psalm? Because one of the things with uh, reading a psalm, praying a psalm is that we are actually involved in it in a way that's even more powerful than listening to a sermon. When you're listening to a sermon, you're receiving it and you can either accept it or not. But when we read a psalm and meditate on a psalm, we are actually reading and participating and confirming what the psalmist has written. Right? So this is a great model for us to see what the psalmist is going through, how he's responding, and then respond in the same manner. So in that way, the psalmist is a great model for us. So first of all, we see that he really loves God and delights in his word. His obedience is not about a legalistic obedience to any commands. He really delights in the word of God. You see that over and over again in the psalm. He prays constantly in all circumstances. It's really the whole psalm is a prayer. But he brings all of his circumstances to God and looks at it through the lens of God's word. He is actually living in a wicked culture and he's troubled a lot by people in his culture. Uh, for example, verse 23, even though princes sit and talk against me, your servant meditates on your statutes. So this is something that we see throughout the psalm. And very similar to our culture, he did live in a culture where uh, he, he faced a lot of problems and we see how he responds to that uh, through the psalm. And, and he is also deeply discouraged. Verse 25, my soul cleaves to the dust, revive me according to your word. Um, so there is a lot about his struggles that we see in the psalm. So it's not only external struggles, he also struggles with sin, but he strives to be holy in the middle of that. And uh, he desires to obey God's command through all of that. One of the exercises we did last week was, there are many verses that he says, I have kept your law. Uh, I have, um, you know, been faithful. But as we see, it's not a perfect obedience, but he desires to and strives to obey to the best of his ability. And finally, he does recognize his own weakness, but he lives in humble dependency on God. The last verse of the psalm, verse 176. I have gone astray like a sh lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Right. So, 
I think this gives a beautiful picture of what progressive sanctification looks like in a Christian's life. So even though it's written by somebody thousand years ago, more than a thousand years ago, this I think is, has really great relevance for us as Christians as we look at how do we deal with external challenges, sin in our lives, how do we pray, how we love God, how we fear God, how we depend on God. So as we read through the psalm and meditate on the psalm piece by piece in over a period of time, I think it's great help to us as we enter into the world of the psalmist and apply it to our context. Okay. All right. So let's actually look at one stanza of the psalm. Our last class we looked very brief, briefly looked at um, the first two stanzas. We'll skip over stanza three and four and look at stanza number five, which is from verse 33 to 40. Please turn in your Bibles or feel free to follow it on the screen here as well. Okay. This is a stanza that begins with the Hebrew letter He. Each of these verses begins with that letter. And let's actually first read through this song. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain. Turn my eyes away from looking at what is worthless and revive me in your ways. Establish your word to, the, to your servant as that which produces reverence for you. Take away my disgrace which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me through your righteousness. So as we look at this psalm, one thing that strikes us immediately is that in each line, he is asking God to do something. Right? So I've highlighted that here. He says, teach me, O Lord, Give me understanding, make me walk in this, incline my heart, turn my eyes away and revive me. Establish your word, take away my disgrace, revive me. So each one is a petition. He's asking God to do something in his life. And there is also a counterpart, he is also responding. He's saying, I shall observe it. I will keep it with all my heart. I delight in it. I have this reverence for you. I long for your precepts. Right? And then there is these three problems. One, there is this temptation for dishonest gain, a temptation for what is worthless. And then there is the problem of the disgrace or the reproach, the people from outside. This is the external problem. Okay. So I think these are the kind of things that he's dealing with in the psalm. And I believe we can break this psalm into three parts. In the first part, he's praying for uh, knowledge, understanding, and guidance. So if you look at these three verses, he begins with, teach me, O Lord. So he wants to know. He then goes to give me understanding, and then make me walk or lead me, guide me. Right. So in response to that knowledge, teach me, and he says, I shall observe it or I will obey it. I will obey your command. Give me understanding. For, then he takes you to the next level. I will keep it with all my heart. I want to understand and keep it with all my heart. Then lead me. And then it's, it gets more personal. He lead me. And I delight in it. Right? So there's these three petitions that we see to that bring in, begins this first section. And then the next section he deals with these two challenges of, or two temptations to sin. Dishonest gain and looking at what is worthless. I think that these two are pretty broad. Uh, dishonest gain or sometimes translated selfish gain or unjust gain can potentially be anything that uh, maybe defrauds somebody else, 
stealing or anything that's a sin against somebody else and looking at what is what is worthless could be a sin of wasting our time and energy could be as uh, trivial as watching TV for a long time or could be something much more serious sin as well right so these are potentially two categories of sin that we, that we could apply for a variety of things so he is saying uh, he wants to desire the word over these kind of sins and he petitions God, he pleads with God to change his heart, to incline his heart to his testimonies and revive him so that he will not fall into these sins. Right, so. And then the third section, the phrase establish your word, uh, the Hebrew word used here for word it's actually the one usually translated promise. Uh, so in the NASB, it may not be too clear, but in the ESV, it actually says, confirm your promise. Basically, what he's asking is, he wants assurance for the trouble that he's been through and also potential sin. He wants confirmation and assurance and reassurance from God so he asks for confirm your promise to your servant and his response is a reverence and verse 39 he's talking about taking away the disgrace or the reproach as you can see in some of the translations um, in the previous two stanzas stanza number three and stanza number four he's gone through quite a bit of the trouble that he's facing and how he is dejected and depressed so here he's actually praying, uh, take that away from me. And he wants revival, he wants comfort from God. But he also says that your judgments are good. He is having these harsh judgments from people outside and he is feeling dejected, but he trusts in God's judgments more than the judgments of the world around him. Right. And then he ends with, I long for your precepts, revive me. So this third section, I think, is about asking God for reassurance and comfort and uh, help as he faces the trouble around him. So and I think that that's probably a good way of breaking up these three Psalms. Hopefully that's been helpful to think about you know, what uh, this section is about. So with that, uh, let's uh, spend some time in discussion.